Hi there, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from AlloryTutors.com and welcome to this video on catalysis. Now a catalyst is a great chemical in that it can speed up the rate of reaction and reduce energy costs as well, particularly in industry uh, and in cars as well. So they play a really vital role. Uh, we're going to look at three different types of catalysis. We're going to look at homogeneous catalysis, heterogeneous catalysis and then autocatalysis there at the end. Uh, we're going to go through each one. We're going to look at the energy profile for at least two of them. And we're going to show you some examples as well of where these catalysts can be used and how they work as well, along with all the equations that you need. So we're going to start with heterogeneous, homogeneous catalysts, sorry, first. So a homogeneous catalyst uh, is basically a catalyst that's in the same phase as the reactants. So what this means is that if you have a, say, for example, a liquid or solution reactants, uh, then your catalyst will also be a liquid and a solution. And uh, it has a very unique energy profile, which I'm going to show you here and then go through an example later on. So you can see here, if we've got an entropy profile here, an energy profile, uh, we have reactants and we have products. Now, the reactants are higher energy than the products in this example. Now, if we had a reaction that was uncatalyzed, what would happen is actually obviously we'd need energy and we need enough energy to uh, reach the activation energy, which is the one right at the top here. Now, if it's uncatalyzed, this activation energy is actually quite high, and so therefore we need to put more energy in than if it was not catalyzed. Um, and you see the red dotted line would show the profile there if it was uncatalyzed and then form the product. But with a catalyst, we actually lower the activation energy, and you don't need as much energy for the reaction to occur. And you can see here that we get this double bump um, uh, profile here. Uh, you can see in the middle bit, we've got something called an intermediate. Now, a homogeneous catalyst works by actually reacting with the reactant initially and then forming a intermediate molecule. And then that intermediate molecule, uh, which is the catalyst, uh, will react with another part of the reaction and allow it to proceed to form a product. Now, I'll show you what I mean in terms of an example, because I think it'll be a lot clearer. So, for example, we're going to use this chemical here, which is s 20 This is called peroxodisulfate, uh, and this reacts with iodine or iodide ions, which is I minus. And the catalyst we're going to use is iron two plus. So this is in solution. Remember, all ions are in solution for this. So normally these two wouldn't react. They're both negatively charged. They don't want to be anywhere near each other. Um, so trying to get these to react without the catalyst is pretty much impossible. So Fe2 plus will play a big role here, and it occurs in two stages, hence the two bumps here. Stage, or step one is we take the peroxodisulfate uh, and the um, iron 2 catalyst, which is here, uh, which is 2Fe2 plus, uh, and that will form a sulfate ion and Fe3 plus. Now, as you can see here, the catalyst is actually acting as a reactant in this case, but it's only reacting with one of the reactants that we had initially, and this is the peroxidisulfate. So you can see here that um, this is going to form our intermediate, which is our Fe3+, and this Fe3+, is actually reacted, or is reacts again, so if I draw an arrow there, it actually reacts secondly with the I-. minus. Now, if we had a look at this in terms of oxidation states, we can see well, actually what's happened is the iron has been oxidized to Fe3+, and the peroxidized sulfate has been reduced to sulfate ions. So the iron 3 then comes along and is then reduced back to Fe2+, which is the original catalyst. But crucially, we're forming two products here, uh, and the products that we're forming are SO4-2- and are I2. And so we're going to write the overall equation here. So the overall equation is going to be able to the reactants here, which is S2, O8, 2 minus, and that's going to react with the I minus, which goes along there. Uh, we're going to have um, two of these, so I'm going to put a two in front of there. Uh, and this is going to form our products. Now our products were 2SO4, 2 minus, uh, and iodine, because they were our products there. But effectively, what we've done, as you can see, we've reacted two negatively charged ions together, uh, and um, we've effectively formed this product here. Now, this is just a very vague overall equation showing what's actually happened. It's not the full ionic equation, so you make sure that if the exam asks that, that you need to be able to do that. 
Uh, but crucially, what you do need to know is how this bit works here. These two equations are the main equations here. And you can see here that we've got the 2Fe2 plus is reformed back again. And that's a key thing for a catalyst. A catalyst may react with the reactants, uh, but it must be reformed. It's never actually used up. And you can see here it's reformed back again at the end. But really useful because we're reacting two negatively charged ions together. Um, and we're using a homogeneous catalyst to do that. And the intermediate, the Fe3+, plus, is this little bump here. And it has to re-react. It's like a double reaction happening at the same time. Okay, so uh, the next one is called a heterogeneous catalyst. So heterogeneous catalyst, as the name suggests, means that the uh, reactants are in different phase to the catalyst. So, for example, you might have gas phase reactants, and these will react with a solid phase uh, catalyst. Uh, I'm going to go through three examples here and show you how this works. Okay, so we're going to look at the Haber process, and in my opinion, I think this is one of the most important reactions ever uh, discovered. It's mainly used, well, the ammonia is mainly used for um, fertilizers on um, for crops, and without that, we wouldn't be able to produce the volumes of food that we can produce today. So um, this uses a catalyst, which is iron. Uh, we have two gases, nitrogen and hydrogen, and the ions obviously are solid. So this is uh, obviously a heterogeneous catalyst. And we're forming ammonia, which is 2NH3. And um, the next one is something called the contact process. Uh, and this is quite useful because, um, again, we're making uh, sulfuric acid from this. I'm going to show you the oxidation states for each as well. And we're going to use uh, vanadium oxide or V2O5. Now, the oxidation state of vanadium here is plus 5. Uh, and what happens is we react that with oxygen, uh, and this forms V2O4. Now, here, vanadium is plus 4, the oxidation state here. So the vanadium here has actually been reduced, but the sulfur dioxide, which is SO2, has actually been oxidized, which is over here. So this is the formed SO3. Uh, and uh, this can actually react with water to form sulfuric acid, which is really, really useful because we can sell that and make money from it. Now, you might think, well, what's the point of this? But actually, some reactions, when we burn fossil fuels in particular, we do produce sulfur dioxide. Uh, and the sulfur dioxide uh, is really acidic when it goes into the atmosphere. So if the sulfur dioxide can be uh, trapped and then turned into something useful, then surely that should be a benefit for the environment and also economically because you can sell the sulfuric acid as well. So that's really, really useful in that case. Uh, now, the biggest problem is obviously we don't have the catalyst. The catalyst has got to be reformed. We've left with V2O5 and actually uh, V2O4, sorry. And the V2O4 then has to react to, with uh, half a mole of oxygen to form V2O5. Now, what we're going to do, I'm just going to change that because that looks a little bit like a 5. So I'm going to change that to an S. So that should be SO2. Okay, so you can see here we've got half O2 is reacting with that to reform our catalyst back again. So again, useful for an environmental point of view. Uh, and the next one is making methanol. Now, uh, methanol, uh, we can use something called Cr2O7, which is a chromate molecule. Uh, and uh, we can actually um, use what we call synthesis gas, which is carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Uh, and we can use that, we can make that by uh, reacting methane, with um, water or steam. Uh, and by heating this up, we can form the synthesis gas. And then from the synthesis gas, we can then make methanol. Now, methanol is really useful as a solvent. Uh, it's used in antifreeze in cars. Uh, it's used as a starting material as well. Uh, you can also use it to make esters, etc. So a really, really useful bulk chemical. Uh, and that's the catalyst they use. Again, heterogeneous. And uh, these two are both gases, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Uh, this is in a solid uh, and we form methanol, which is uh, a liquid as a product. So we are using a heterogeneous catalyst there. Okay. And the final type of catalyst is autocatalysis. And this is when a product actually catalyzes a reaction. So it self catalyzes. So you don't actually need to add any catalyst to this. So that could be a benefit uh, in terms of cost because we're not having to separate it or try and remove the catalyst. It actually does it itself. There's only some reactions that will do that, though not all of them will do this. So, for example, we're going to look at the oxidation of ethane dioic acid using manganate um, 7 ions. So, it's all written in Roman numerals for transition metals. So, you can see we've got a reaction here, and here's our manganate ions here, uh, reacting with 16H+, with our what we call ethane dioic acids, or ethane dioate ions, which are these ones here. 
uh, and that's going to form Mn2 plus plus 8 water plus 10 carbon dioxide. Now, this reaction, this is an ionic equation. So an ionic equation is formed from two half equations. In the exam, you might be expected to write the two half equations and then combine to form the ionic equation. For speed, though, I've just written the full ionic equation there. So you can actually construct that from the two half equations. So you don't actually need to remember that, uh, that bit um, off by heart, thankfully, because it's a massive equation. Okay, But because this is an autocatalysis reaction, actually what happens is we're going to um, split these up into two, two kind of reactions to show you what happens. So we're going to take the uh, Mn2+, plus, um, which is this bit here. Now, this actually uh, produces a product, which is Mn3+, plus, which is over here. So the Mn2+, plus will react with the manganate ions to form 8 and 8H+, plus, and it forms Mn3+, plus, plus 4 water. So remember, this is our catalyst. It's a product of the reaction, but that product is actually acting as a catalyst to get this thing going. And this is how it works in the first instance. So the product is the catalyst, reacts with the manganate ions, H+, plus, uh, and it will form Mn3+, plus, plus 4H2O. Now, 4H2O was one of our products, which is over here. So, uh, and you can see that was actually written over here. It's one of our products that's actually made. So we've got one product. But this Mn3+, plus, or this intermediate, actually then reacts again to, with the, this time, it's reacting with the C2O4, so the uh, ethane dioate ion, which is this one here, C2O4 2 minus. Uh, it reacts with that, and it forms our other two products, which is carbon dioxide and then Mn2+. Plus. And then this Mn2+, plus can then go back and react again. And it will keep on reacting uh, until there's no more uh, reactants left. Now, we need to know the energy profile for this as well. And you can see here, we've got the concentration of the um, products in this, uh, of the reactant, sorry, in this case, because we're starting off with a lot of products here, uh, reactant, sorry. Uh, and then we're going to watch it as it proceeds over time. So at the start of the reaction, because we haven't got much Mn2 plus ions, uh, then the reaction is going to be very, very slow. Uh, it's uh, an uncatalyzed reaction, and so the profile ends up quite flat. But then as we start to develop more Mn2+, plus, the reaction then starts to really pick up pace, uh, and it starts to really react quite quickly until eventually we get down towards the bottom where it flattens back out again. Now, the reason why is because the reactants are effectively running out. So the reactants are the limiting factor here, but up here, the limiting factor is the amount of Mn2 plus that's being produced because the reaction's just started. So make sure you can comment on the limiting factors as well. Uh, just a final thing is looking at the pros and cons. Uh, the homogeneous catalysts, uh, the pros are that actually mixes well within the solution. So this is a very effective catalyst at speeding up the rate of reaction. However, because it's homogeneous catalyst, it's in the same phase, it's really difficult to separate out. Uh, once you've got your products, you need to try and get rid of that catalyst as well. Uh, the heterogeneous catalysts, uh, the advantages are that it's easy to separate, unlike the homogeneous catalyst. Um, and the downside really is that these things can get poisoned because normally the um, catalyst is mounted onto a wire mesh um, and then that can get blocked. The pores can get blocked in the wire mesh uh, and that can cause a problem as well. Also, um, that it might not be as effective as a homogeneous catalyst uh, purely because the uh, reactants can't all access the uh, heterogeneous catalyst. And a heterogeneous catalyst effectively works by a chemical sticking onto the surface of the catalyst. We call that adsorption with a D, and then it desorbs off once it's reacted with something else. So it's a bit like uh, sellotape or sticky tape, um, where something can stick to it, uh, and then it's released uh, later on. So that's probably the best way to describe a heterogeneous catalyst. Uh, autocatalysis uh, is very useful because actually you don't need to add a catalyst, so it's pretty cheap. Um, however, there is only certain reactions that can do this, uh, and the reaction is actually limited by uh, certain factors as well, at the top here, at the start, and at the end of the reaction as well, so that's pretty important. But um, there you go, there's a lot there. Uh, make sure you know um, the three different types of catalysis and all the reactions and how it actually works as well. That's the really important bit, is actually understanding how this works. That's it. Bye-bye.